organized it. Uh, and my objective was to try to bring some uh, discourse to this important topic. And I happen to be friendly with these two individuals. And I know that their concern is to move uh, forward in uh, bettering the lives of uh, people who were affected by policing. And uh, so they agreed uh, to this uh, debate or uh, discourse. Uh, the way that this will be uh, done is each will speak first for 15 minutes, then they'll speak for seven minutes, then they'll speak for three minutes, and then uh, I might have one or two questions for them, but it will be open to the audience. And actually, at some point, uh, looking for a volunteer here, uh, the way people can try to have their questions asked is they have to write it out on the card. It'll be brought to me, and I will uh, then it, uh, ask the questions. Uh, there will not be any hand raise and so on. Uh, we decided that that was the best way uh, to keep this somewhat disciplined. Uh, but again, it's going to be 15 minutes each, then seven, then three. I do want to make a few opening remarks. Uh, I think there's some data which is useful uh, to have out there uh, when we go into this. I mean, there's a myriad of things one can talk about with the future of policing, uh, but let me present uh, some data that might be useful in the discourse. Uh, one piece of data has to do with uh, black men, unarmed black men being killed by the police. That certainly is what has energized a lot of this uh, issue. Uh, in 2015, there were 94 uh, men uh, and women who were killed by the police who were unarmed. 38 of them were black Americans. In 2016, the total number was 48, and 17 were unarmed black Americans were killed by the police. And this year, the numbers uh, may be slightly lower. At this point, there's been 15 unarmed black men and women who've been killed by the police. So that's one piece of data that may be useful. Uh, only give it. Uh, I didn't know I had so many. OK. Uh, so that's one piece. The second piece of data that also is in the news, particular uh, with the murders in Chicago, is the number of black Americans who have been killed by, uh, who have been murdered each year. In 20, uh, that murder rate has gone up. In the 30 largest cities in the United States, in 2015, it, it went up from 2014 by 13%. In 2016, it went up by another 14%. So the murders are going up, and that's certainly true for black Americans. In 2016, there were 7,881 black Americans who were murdered. That represented 52% of the total, and it was about 900 more than the previous year. So that uh, there is this issue of uh, deaths, and certainly there's an issue of what, if anything, constructive the police can do about that. Uh, as an economist, I want to make one point about this, and that is it's very hard to link these murder rates with employment. Uh, there's a certain viewpoint that it's because of the lack of jobs, people feel powerless, they're, uh, they end up doing uh, bad things, including murders. It ended up that between 
2007 and, and 2010, the Great Recession uh, reduced the employment of black men by 19 percent, and yet the murder rate went down. Since 2010, the employment rate has gone up for black men, particularly for 20 to 24 year olds, by 18 percent, and yet, as I've indicated, the murder rates uh, in, um, within black communities has gone up. So, yes, employment is an important thing, and uh, more should be done about it improving employment, but it doesn't appear that that's going to have a significant effect on the murder rates. Uh, the last point is a, a quarter of the killings by police. Uh, there are about a thousand killings each year by police, uh, of which I said, you know, there's a small percentage that are unarmed, but about a quarter of those killings by police are with people who have mental illness. And, you know, there's an issue of how, how the police department approaches those, where in many cases they know ahead of time that they're going to be dealing with somebody who has a mental illness. Um, with this being said, let me turn it over through a flip of the coin. Heather will go first. Great. I think I'm going to the podium. Thank you so much, Professor Cherry, and thank you, Brooklyn College, for inviting me. It's an honor to be debating Professor Vitale, who's made such important contributions uh, to the discourse about policing, especially in New York. So I, this is a privilege to be here, and thank you for your attention. Let me state some core principles at the onset. First, the police have an absolute obligation to treat everyone they encounter with courtesy and respect and within the confines of the law. Too often, cops developed a hardened, obnoxious attitude towards the public. Second, every police shooting of an unarmed civilian is a stomach-churning tragedy. Tactical training has to work incessantly to avoid such calamities. And third, given this country's appalling history of racism, and the use of police brutality to maintain slavery and segregation, police shootings of black men are particularly and understandably fraught. But however tragic the history of policing and race in this country, patterns of policing today do not demonstrate racial bias. Contemporary policing is determined by two factors, the incidence of criminal victimization and community demands for assistance. It is crime data that sends police to minority neighborhoods in order to save lives. To understand contemporary data-driven policing, you first have to look at the facts of crime, however uncomfortable it may be to do so. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, blacks die of homicide at six times the rate of whites and Hispanics combined. This is a problem that gets almost no recognition from anyone other than the police. That homicide victimization rate is a function of the black homicide commission rate. Blacks commit homicide at eight times the rate of whites and Hispanics combined, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics. In the 75 largest counties in the U.S., which is where most of the population resides, blacks commit over half of all violent crime there, even though they're 15 percent of the population in those counties. These crime disparities are repeated in virtually every big city in the country. Here in New York City, blacks commit 71 percent of all shootings and 70 percent of all robberies, though they're 23 percent of the city's population. How do we know that? That's what the victims of and witnesses to those shootings who are overwhelmingly minority themselves, tell the police. Whites commit less than 2% of all shootings, though they're 34% of the city's population. Again, this is according to victims and witnesses. A black New Yorker is 50 times more likely to commit a shooting than a white New Yorker. Add Hispanic shootings to black shootings, and you account for 98% of all shootings in New York City. 
In Chicago, blacks and whites are each a little under a third of the city's population. Blacks commit 80% of all homicides and shootings, whites 1%. A black Chicagoan is 80 times more likely to engage in a drive-by shooting than a white Chicagoan. Now these disparities mean that virtually every time an urban cop is called to a shooting scene, he's called to a minority neighborhood on behalf of a minority victim and being given the description of a minority suspect, if anyone's cooperating. In Brownsville, Brooklyn, for example, the per capita shooting rate is 81 times higher than in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. The cops don't wish this disparity. It's forced on them by the reality of crime. On those shots fired calls, the police will likely make pedestrian stops and enforce open warrants and parole conditions in the hope of preventing a retaliatory shooting. In so doing, they will generate precisely the racially disproportionate stop and arrest data that can be used against them in a racial profiling lawsuit. But they are generating that racially disproportionate activity because of the incidents of criminal victimization, not out of bias. Let me give you a sense of what this violent street crime looks like. Last year, 4,300 people were shot in Chicago. That's one person every two hours. The victims were almost all black. They included 24 children under the age of 12, among them a three-year-old boy mowed down on Father's Day 2016, who's now paralyzed for life, and a 10-year-old boy shot in August, whose pancreas, intestines, kidney, and spleen were torn apart. This year, Chicago's shooting victims include a 73-year-old man strolling in a southwest side Chicago neighborhood in August who refused to turn over his wallet, phone, and keys to a group of 14 robbers. They shot him in the abdomen. That same month, two gunmen wearing bandanas ran towards the doors of a church on a Sunday morning and fatally shot an usher and his friend who were leading parishioners inside. Also in August, a 28-year-old man who refused to hand over his car to carjackers at 2 a.m. was fatally shot in the chest. In July, a four-year-old boy was shot on the west side while standing next to his mother. She was fatally shot in the head. Another four-year-old boy and his six-year-old sister were shot while getting snow cones with their father on the west side. Still in July, a 10-year-old boy was fatally shot in the back while riding in an SUV with his stepfather. Two girls, 7 and 13, were shot in June on an elementary school playground during a picnic. I could go on, but I won't. If 4,300 white people, including two dozen children, had been shot in Chicago last year, there would be a national uproar, if not a revolution. It is almost unthinkable. But these drive-by shootings are not happening in white neighborhoods. If they were, however, the police would engage in the same tactics as they used to try to quell violent street crime in minority neighborhoods. Because the victims were almost all black, the national press ignores the bloodbath. The police, however, do not. They are in high crime areas because the community calls them there and because that is where people are being most victimized. Again, these are facts not of the police's making, but they are what determine deployment in an era of data-driven policing. And they are what create disparate police activity data that the activists seize upon as showing police bias. The other factor that drives police activity is community requests for assistance. Go to any police community meeting in a high crime area and you will hear some version of the following requests. Why can't you keep the dealers off the corner? You arrest them and they're back the next day. There's teens hanging out in the street fighting. Whatever happened to truancy and loitering laws? There's trespassers in my lobby smoking weed and selling drugs. I'm scared to go down to get my mail. At the 41st Precinct in the South Bronx, I observed residents complain repeatedly about large groups of youth hanging out on corners. Quote, there's too much fighting, one woman said. There was more than 100 kids shot, the other ki 100 kids fighting the other day. They beat on a girl about 14 years old. They take marijuana inside the school. A middle-aged man asked, why are they hanging out in crowds on the corners? No one does anything about it. Can't you arrest them for loitering laws? 
They're perched there like birds. Should the police respond to these requests made by minority residents, or should the police ignore them because they would entail enforcing the law against minority children? The president of a local mentoring program begged for a police watchtower in his neighborhood. Whenever he hears gunfire, he says he runs towards the shooting, terrified that one of his three children has been shot. If the NYPD honored his request for a surveillance tower, Columbia law professor Bernard Harcourt would undoubtedly accuse the department of subjecting the neighborhood to a Foucaultian panopticon. Whom should the NYPD listen to? The father of three, who lives with the reality of drive-by shootings, or Bernard Harcourt, who does not? These demands for public order enforcement are absolutely typical. In August 2016, both the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun sent reporters to high crime areas of West Baltimore. They both reported the identical phenomenon. Community members begging the police to, in the words of the Washington Post, quote, clear their corners of miscreants and restore order to their crime-plagued community, end quote. After the Freddie Gray riots in April 2016, the Baltimore police virtually stopped enforcing drug laws and other low-level offenses. Shootings spiked along with loitering and other street disorder. The owner of a local copy store told the Baltimore Sun, quote, after the riots it got bad, like the drug dealers were having conventions on this block. All this drug activity, it scares people away, legitimate people, honest people, end quote. The owner calls the police if the people hanging out in front of his store don't leave when asked to do so. If the police respond to his and other such requests, to clear their properties of loiterers, they will generate racially disproportionate activity that can be used against them in a racial profiling lawsuit. So should they ignore these hardworking people? This month, New York Times reporters attended a police community meeting in the North Bronx. A man complained about drug use in a playground. A woman reported drug dealing at a Chinese business. In Bedford-Stuyvesant, Officers had to explain why they could not easily, quote, stop people from smoking marijuana in privately owned buildings, end quote. In other words, someone at that meeting had made the same complaint that I have heard over and over at such gatherings, quote, I smell weed in my hallway. Why can't you do something about it? Are these minority residents racist? This observed support for public order enforcement is backed up by polling data. In a Quinnipiac poll from 2015, slightly more black than white voters in New York City said they want the police to, quote, actively issue summons or make arrests in their neighborhood for quality of life offenses. 61% of black voters wanted such summons and arrests, with 33% opposed, versus 59% of white voters in support, with 37% opposed. In an earlier era, the rap against the police was that they ignored crime in minority neighborhoods. Indeed, some people still suspect the police of ignoring minority requests for public order policing. This August, a black Chicago alderman accused the Chicago police of simply driving by disorder in his community. Quote, quality of life issues are not being enforced in, community of colors, in communities of color, said Alderman Anthony Beal. Quote, Guys hanging out on a corner shooting crap. A group of guys on the corner drinking. People having parties that get out of hand. A lot of your drive-by shootings are people hanging out on corners. That's an opportunity. If we police quality of life issues, we take away the opportunity. Is Beal a racist for wanting the types of policing that Bernard Harcourt and other activists denounce as oppressive and that would generate racially disproportionate stops. Public order enforcement tracks perfectly with 9-11 and 311 calls for enforcement. Should the police ignore those 911 calls because they come overwhelmingly from minority neighborhoods? This is not a rhetorical question. The stop and arrest data that are the basis of racial profiling lawsuits are generated precisely from this kind of enforcement. Is policing as good as it could be? Of course not. Cops are desperate for more hands-on tactical training. 
that would allow them to avoid having to use force. I know officers who pay for their own training since their departments don't provide enough of it. They need more work in communication and de-escalation skills. There are officers who have lost the ability to interact courteously and respectfully with the public if they ever had it. If they can't be retrained, they should be off the force. But let's not forget a reason why some officers may become peremptory and obnoxious after years on the streets. Because of things like airmail, i.e. bags of feces and urine and dirty diapers thrown off of roofs from them at them by criminals and their associates. The vast majority of officers, however, come to policing because they want to do good in the world and continue to believe fervently in the good people in, their high, in the high crime areas who deserve the same freedom from fear as people in other areas take for granted. Policing is a second best solution to crime. Ideally, informal social controls like families would maintain civility. But as long as social disorder and crime remain higher in some neighborhoods, people there will beg for police protection. And officers would be heartless and in violation of their sworn duty not to respond. Thank you for your attention. You had another minute. <laughs> I'd say that. You only get I'll take it. Save it. No. <laughs> I don't trust this. Don't trust the water on the podium. Uh, <clears throat> Robert, thanks so much for putting this together, and Heather for coming to, all the way out here to Brooklyn College to see us all. Uh, I just want to thank also a couple of other people. Uh, my editor from Verso is here, Andy Shaw. And most importantly, uh, my wife, for without whom none of this would have been possible, is here. Uh, so uh, really appreciative also of uh, a lot of uh, colleagues and friends who've, who've come out this evening. So black communities are hurting. They're hurting in a lot of ways. And crime is a really desperate expression of that. Now, Robert suggests that, well, even if we have some gains in employment that doesn't seem to make any real difference, it makes some short-term difference, but I think it's a mistake to think about this as a short-term set of effects because the underlying forces that have created the dynamic that we're in were not formed overnight, were not formed over the last two or three years, were not formed over these short time horizons. As Heather pointed out in her opening uh, principles, there are long legacies of not implicit bias, but overt racism that have shaped the conditions in these communities. We can talk about slavery and convict leasing and Jim Crow, but we can also talk about more recent things like redlining and the ghettoization of northern communities the effects of deindustrialization on the northern cities. Discrimination in hiring and employment. Any time we do audit studies, any time we look for discrimination in housing and employment, we find it. Whether it's discrimination based on the names on the application or who shows up at the interview, we find that discrimination. Austerity politics, the bipartisan consensus around supply-side economics, that is starving many cities of basic resources while transferring more and more wealth to the very tops of the economy. A declining safety net. The breaking of public sector unions. We're facing that with the Janus decision now on a national level. Uh, the incredible disparities in education funding that are tied to local area property taxes automatically puts these communities at an ongoing disadvantage. So we can't have a discussion about short-term changes in employment rates, nor can we have a discussion about the neutral impact of policing without an acknowledgement that we don't start from an equal basis. So yes, it's true, white communities are not subjected to some of the policing tactics, like gang, various gang suppression policing tactics, 
that white communities are subjected to, but there's a reason why the conditions are different in those two communities, and it cannot be reduced to the lack of two-parent families, which is a theme throughout Heather's book that was not discussed in the opening, that, that somehow the number one challenge facing these communities is that the, the men are not in the home. Well, we've had a 25-year decline in crime, and yet that statistic has actually gotten worse. And also, it doesn't explain what's going on with the executives at Enron and Goldman Sachs and the Bernie Madoffs. It doesn't explain the sports rioting that's become endemic on college campuses with the property destruction and the burning of cars. Those kids were not uh, suffering from parental problems. There are bigger forces at work here. So, does that mean that policing is somehow a racist enterprise? something that Heather goes at great pains to show the limitations of an argument that focuses primarily on racial bias and discrimination. I think she makes some important points here. I don't think we can reduce this problem to one of racial bias. She and I share a deep skepticism about implicit bias research and the idea that this will somehow fix policing or that if we just diversify police forces, that this will fix policing. I, I agree that there's a lot of reason for skepticism about that. I believe that the vast majority of police officers approach their jobs from a place of genuinely wanting to help, of trying to enforce the law in a neutral way. Does that mean there's no racism in policing? I don't accept that premise either. Once again, when we look for it, we find it. It's there, under the surface. When we look at the emails, when we look at the radio transmissions, when we look at the chat line, chat boards that police, uh, we find that racism. So it's there, but I don't think that is the core issue. Is the leadership of police departments racist? Are they organizing policing in a way to perpetuate some kind of racial project. By and large, especially in the big city police departments, I don't think that's true. Is there sometimes a lack of clarity, uh, insensitivity to things, a certain blue lives matter, thin blue line mentality that shapes what they do? Yes. But it's not the same as the kind of Jim Crow racism of the pre-war era. Instead, police are left in a fundamentally untenable situation, which is that they have been asked to solve the problems that have been hundreds of years in the making using a very limited set of tools. I have a little quote here from... Uh, David Brown, who was uh, chief of police in Dallas when those police officers were shot, he's since resigned, written a book. He says, we're asking cops to do too much in this country. We are. Every societal failure, we put it off on the cops to solve. Not enough mental health funding, let the cops handle it. Here in Dallas, we got a loose dog problem. Let's have the cops chase loose dogs. Schools fail, let's give it to the cops. That's too much to ask. Policing was never meant to solve all those problems. So black communities have problems. The question is, is policing the best, most just way of addressing those problems? Now, Heather's absolutely right. If you go to these community meetings, I take my students. I've done extensive research at these community meetings. Yes, you hear a lot of people who want to bring back stop and frisk, who want to see more aggressive policing, who want those kids off the corners. I think some of them would be happy with what's going on in the Philippines, frankly, that we should really get rid of these drug dealers. Now, of course, these bodies are not particularly representative of these communities. We've got extensive research around the country that shows that. There are a lot of voices absent in these meetings. We don't hear from young people. We don't hear from recent immigrants. We don't hear from people who've been homeless or drug-involved 
We don't often hear from the parents of the teenagers who are then targeted for a lot of this intensive and invasive policing. But that's not to say that there isn't a demand to do something. The problem is that these communities have been given a very narrow terrain in which to make their demands. Look at James Foreman Jr.'s book about Washington, D.C. He shows very clearly that there were intense debates in Washington among black politicians about what to do about increasing crime and drug problems. These are very real concerns, and they really struggled with this. And what is important to point out is that those decisions, however, were made in the context of a broad austerity politics that gave them limited resources from the federal government and internally. What's also important to point out is that while they did embrace the war on drugs and they did embrace tough on crime measures, there were voices in political circles, in the communities, who said this is a mistake, this is criminalizing our communities, and the results will be mass incarceration. And they were right. And there was a choice that could have been made differently there. So to say that because there are some voices who are desperate to have something done about crime, and the only tool that's offered to them is the police, and they then ask for police help, is not to say that policing is the only best solution in that situation. So for me, this is not a debate about whether the police need a little bit more training and a little bit more diversity, whether they should be friendlier, more law-abiding and respectful. I mean, I'd like all those things. I'd like to see fewer people killed, whether they're armed or not, whether they're fighting with the police or not. But the solution to that has to come through rethinking what it is we've asked police to do fundamentally. It's too much. So just imagine a few things. Why is it that we have a crumbling mental health infrastructure and yet the primary service we provide to mentally ill people is the police? When someone calls 911 and someone in their house is having a mental health crisis, we do not send trained medical professionals, we send armed police. And then we argue about what kind of training the police would have. A quarter of all people killed by police in the United States are having a mental health crisis at the time they're killed. Now, were some of them armed? Yes. Did some of them fight with the police? Yes. Was the policing racist? Generally, no. Not the point. Why are we sending the police in the first place? They don't send the police in the UK. They send mental health nurse practitioners who have the health records of the people they're responding to. You call an entirely different number, and the police have nothing to do with the vast majority of these cases. And there are a quarter of a million of these calls every year in New York City. This is not some tiny thing that police do on the side. We have more NYPD personnel in city schools than we have counselors of all varieties. Thousands. And it's based on a lot of flawed ideas. School policing based on the super predator myth that was perpetrated in the 1990s. It was an over misguided response to the Columbine shooting. There were armed police at Columbine that day and it made no difference. It's also being driven by the reorganization of education, high stakes testing, charter schools. The success of schools is now judged based on these test scores and graduation rates the ability of these for-profit charter schools to stay functioning is based on these test scores. They have an incentive to engage in these kinds of zero-tolerance discipline policies that drive kids out of school combined with the introduction of police into the disciplinary process. All across the country, we see police as tools of driving the kids who are dragging down the test scores out of the schools. In New York, we found that the Success Academy had got-to-go lists of kids who were a problem for them that needed to be driven out of the school. 
Sometimes this is, we're talking about elementary school kids. And of course the effects of this have a very profound racial dimension. Doesn't mean the teachers are racist, but the way we've structured this whole system produces racially disparate outcomes regardless of intentionality. Gang policing, let's take some serious violent crime. I don't have time to go into a lot of details. There was a brand new study done here in New York just a few weeks ago released at John Jay College, their research center, saying that we have these new cure violence sites in New York. They've been around for a handful of years now. They're trying to do violence interruption in the communities. Pro-health messaging, safety messaging, get kids involved in pro-social activities. The results are fantastic. They did experimental studies comparing cure violence sites with similar control neighborhoods. Gun violence dropped dramatically in the cure violence sites and no police were involved. No one was threatened, no one was coerced, no one went to prison, nobody got shot. This is what we need to do. Policing should be understood as a profoundly coercive and dangerous tool with a really checkered legacy and past and should be understood as the tool of last resort instead of what it is today, the tool of first resort. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that excellent rejoinder. Uh, I completely agree that police, you can't hear? Okay, sorry. I'll go back up. <coughs> I'm in complete agreement with Professor Vitale about many things. Policing is not the ideal solution to uh, the levels of crime that are bearing down on so many innocent people in high crime communities. But when you do not have uh, the informal methods of social control above all the family, uh, policing is what people are going to reach for in order to get violent predators off the streets. Professor Vitale is absolutely right. My root cause for crime, which is the breakdown of the family, did not uh, change or improve over the last 20 years. Uh, but neither did uh, Professor Vitale's root causes for crime, which is income inequality or, or joblessness as Frank Zimmering has shown in his analysis of the New York City crime drop, all of the conventional explanations for crime on both the right and the left basically stayed the same. Uh, the only thing that changed in New York between the time in 1990 when we had 2,245 homicide deaths and in recent years when we've got a little over 300 is a revolution in policing that imposed ruthless accountability on precinct commanders for, this, for the safety of the residents of their communities and that targeted policing uh, at crime hotspots uh, and, that, and that paid attention to quality of life concerns. Professor Vitale blames austerity politics uh, for crime and, and frankly again this is not a debate about the causes of crime, uh, but he blames austerity politics. It's, it's hard, frankly, to apply that to New York City. We have been the welfare capital of the United States. There is a very, very large social services budget in this city. Uh, there's communities where most of the enterprise there is nonprofit uh, social service programs that are subsidized by taxpayers. Uh, and we had decades of that, and crime continued to go up. Again, what brought crime down and saved 
thousands, tens of thousands of minority lives uh, was the proactive data-driven policing revolution. Uh, Professor Vitale t today says, well, I'm not really lodging a complaint of racism against the police. Uh, that's not the impression one gets really from reading his book, I don't think, where there's a lot of race-based arguments made, but he's, then he says, well, we do find it if you look under the hood. Uh, and the fact that the community councils, the police community councils that are urging the police to restore order are not wholly representative uh, doesn't, I don't know what the police are supposed to do. These are the people who show up. These are the elderly who are terrified. Again, I, I spoke to a cancer amputee in the Mount Hope section of the Bronx who said to me, police Jesus, send more police. Uh, she said, when the police are here, you can go down into the lobby. Uh, otherwise, she will not go down because it is taken over by people there trespassing. Uh, there's, of course, we have a mental health crisis. Is it ideal that we respond with the police? No. Uh, and I would certainly agree with Professor Vitale if we have another way uh, to, to respond that will put the victims less at risk as well as police officers, that would be ideal. But, uh, and the programs that he talks about as far as using gang interrupters, they sound good, and it would be great if they worked. If there were, if there were alternatives to policing that had as, as pro profound a, an effect in bringing down crime, of course they should be implemented. But we have been trying these programs since the 1960s. The 1960s and early 1970s were a preview of the what we're moving for now, which is de-incarceration and de decriminalization. Uh, there was an effort to keep more and more people uh, out, of, out of prison and into programs. This was a time of very high economic growth and violent crime in this city, in this country, went through the roof. Uh, so Professor Vitale and I are in large agreement about many things. Uh, policing is it at best a second best solution and, and informal controls would be ideal, but the debate is I think that the discourse we've been having in this country for the last three years has been a profoundly dangerous one. It has resulted in the crime increase that Professor Cherry mentioned in his opening remarks, we've had a 20% increase in our national homicide rate, 1,800 additional black males have died over the last two years compared with 2014, and that is because the police are now backing off of the types of proactive policing that can save lives. Thank you. So should we just uh, go back to the war on poverty of the 1960s? The problem is, you know, we're not still doing the war on poverty. If we'd just done that, everything would be fine now. No, that's not what I'm calling for. Yes, there are things about the war on poverty that were never fully implemented, in my opinion. There was a rolling back of it very quickly, and actually social conditions did get worse as we rolled back the war on poverty. So I think there are a lot of things we could look to there, but there's also a lot we've learned since then. So that just uh, some of the broad brush efforts were not successful, were not well implemented, and were not well targeted. What I try to do in the book is to be very targeted. In every chapter, I discuss concrete programs where there's been examples tried out I try to really lay out what it would look like. And let's be clear, the approach of the book is to say that we should not start with de-policing, as some call it. We should not just pull all the police off the streets and then try to figure out what should be done. 
Instead, we should look at concrete, specific things that police do and look at concrete, specific alternatives and that we should begin to implement those alternatives, give them a chance to work. If that means pulling the police back at some level, then we need to start doing that. Some of these things are inconsistent with heavy-handed policing. What we hear from gang interrupters and other community-based anti-violence workers is that when they're trying to reach out to these kids and bring them into pro-social activities, get them off the streets, get them out of the gangs, the police play a role in driving them back into these situations. For one, by putting them into juvenile facilities and jails which are run by gangs, where they have no choice but to relate to the existing gang structures. I was talking to a former gang member last night at John Jay College who said, how do you think some of these small gangs like the Bloods and Crips who started out in the little neighborhoods, how do you think these things spread throughout the city so quickly? Because the kids all ended up in Rikers together and the idea perpetuated from there. So uh, we need targeted interventions, not community policing. Here's a targeted intervention for you. You mentioned the, the grandmother who's got the weed smoking in the lobby and is fearful. I agree. I wrote an essay after a Kai Gurley was killed, not far from here, in the pink houses. Accidentally, negligently, etc., a vertical patrol, the police trying to restore order in that public housing project with mixed effects, in part because nothing was done about the broken elevators and the broken lights and the broken locks on the front door. And what I said at the time is, you know what might be a lot more effective than police who know nothing about the building randomly patrolling? How about let's actually have doormen in these public housing projects? Heather has a great example in the book of a concerted effort by tenants to kind of retake a building by acting essentially as doormen. That is a kind of informal social control. But when you suggest to the housing authority that these people might be made safer by doormen, you're just laughed off. But they've got hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on surveillance cameras, target hardening, and more police. So this is not just about practicality and effectiveness, there's an ideological component to this that says that we live in a world in which the poor cannot be trusted to run their own affairs, that our economy has to be oriented towards subsidizing only the most wealthy and most successful in the hopes that something will trickle down to the rest of us. There are a lot of public employees in this room who have yet to see any trickle down out of 40 years of supply-side economics. We've seen our standard of living fall, 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 right? But every year there's more money for tax cuts for the top of the income code. So we have to both address the practical questions of what will actually make communities safer with the least use of punitive and coercive force and we have to address these larger ideological issues. Thank you. Uh, if people want to ask questions, we passed out some things. Uh, other people, if they want, they have to write uh, their question, and in a few minutes they'll be collected. Okay. We still have three minutes. Okay. I don't need these signs. <laughs> you might need the one. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I, I look forward to Professor Vitale's voice in the future as the voice that he's manifested tonight, uh, which is very much one that I can agree with. Uh, I don't think it, it's uh, necessarily in line with his book, nor has he been a big supporter of public enforce, uh, public order enforcement, also known as broken windows policing, uh, in the national debate, which and the city debate, which he has characterized really as a a form of, of oppression. Uh, but I'm glad that we both agree that this is what the police are hearing 
uh, when they go to police community meetings. Uh, I, I would think it's great to have doormen in housing projects. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I cannot believe that there is a resistance to do the, to that on some class-based or, or racial grounds. Um, and it certainly does not stem from any idea that uh, the poor can't be trusted to run their own affairs. There are councils in housing uh, projects that, again, beg for law enforcement. Uh, they beg for uh, a stricter tenant policy uh, to remove family members that are dealing drugs, and their voices should be listened to. Uh, I Again, if, if there's programs that have a proven track record that can do as much to reduce crime as policing has, bring them on. Uh, but the gang interrupter Gary Slutkin public health model has been tried in Chicago. Uh, it has devolved into uh, the, the gang interrupters going back into criminal activity, and it has really shown no long-term effects. So it's a really an empirical question uh, of what works. And if, if researchers can come up with programs after 40 years of trying that can have as good effect on saving lives as data-driven proactive policing, we should do it and, and, and bring the police, bring them back uh, and, and do not use them as assertively as we need to. But for a gang member to blame uh, ending up in Rikers on his gang activities, I think, is uh, shifting responsibility. This is a personal decision to get involved in crime, uh, and he should be held accountable. So I certainly hope I didn't leave anyone with the impression that I'm in favor of public order policing or that I think race is not a really important dynamic in all of this. Uh, I think the broken windows policing is, uh, I think broken windows theory, the policing is, is deeply problematic and not particularly evidence-based. Uh, that and uh, stop and frisk policing, I think, are, are deeply problematic, not because they are necessarily racist, but because, as I said in my opening, they take the racial inequalities that exist as given, and the effect of implementing them does nothing to reduce those inequalities and quite likely, in my opinion, makes them worse. So to say that this drive for a policing-centered approach is not driven by a kind of uh, belief that the police are incapable of managing their own affairs belies the, the underlying theory that drives the broken windows theory. Um, I, I will not quote from Edward Banfield, but very, uh, who James Q. Wilson was a big fan of, uh, Ms. McDonald has quoted on a number of occasions, he definitely believed that the poor would just, they didn't mind not having social services, and when they got them, they'd just ruin them or not use them. The broken windows theory, in its essence, says that people left to their own devices will kind of run wild in the streets, and the only way to restore civility, especially in certain communities, is for the police to micromanage those public behaviors. And I think that that's fundamentally problematic, and that we should always look to reestablishing the ability of communities to self-manage themselves, and heavy-handed policing is the worst possible way to do that. Is it possible that the police, through concerted effort, can drive drug dealers out of a park? Of course. Can they get homeless people off a particular corner? Of course. But does that make those communities better? What we're seeing is too often a dynamic where the police in this thin blue line mentality are like, well, to save 80% of the community, we've got to destroy the other 20% by constant harassment, arrests, violence, incarceration. 
that seems like pretty bad math to me. That does not seem like real justice to me. How can we make these communities better with the least reliance on these coercive mechanisms? And turning the police into the enforcers of a moral order that may be of the making of people who come to community meetings, may have even broad support in these communities, seems deeply problematic to me. So I hope we can continue to talk about many of the evidence-based alternatives to relying on police to deal with many of these problems. Thank you. Okay, why don't, uh, why don't, maybe you can go collect the cards. Let of, people raise their hand. Raise their hand. I think has the last. Oh, you, if you want to because she say first. Yes, you can. Oh, oh, well, thank you. That's very generous of you. You have another 15 minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that statement was actually more in accord with what I've sort of been used to hearing from Professor Vitale, which is that broken windows policing is deeply problematic, uh, it takes racial inequality as a given, makes it worse. He has not answered my question, what should the police do when they get these heartfelt requests to get the dealers off the corner, to get the kids off my stoop? Uh, to get them out of my lobby so I can get the uh, go down and get my mail without fear. The police are not making this up. This is what people in the community want. Uh, it is not any kind of racial agenda on their part. Uh, and the police take the problems as they find them. Uh, it is completely wrong his Professor Vitale's characterization of broken windows theory, which is that people left to their own devices will run wild. Uh, the only way to restore order is for police to micromanage those behaviors. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know where that's coming from. Uh, broken windows theory comes most profoundly from those requests, from those voices. It, it's not the police generating this idea out of the blue, it's what people are asking them. They want the same sort of order in the streets that people in other neighborhoods take for granted. Uh, there is an aspect to this theory that if you take care of the small infractions of order, uh, you can avert more serious crimes for, for happening. I quoted Anthony Beale, a black alderman, making exactly that argument, that you allow the public drinking on the corner, the hanging out, drive-by shootings emerge from that. Uh, that happened uh, when Tanika Holmes, an 11-year-old girl in Chicago last year, uh, was fatally shot by a marijuana dealer hanging out on the corner who was shooting at rivals. Uh, People should not have to live with that kind of fear, and they want to be free of it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question of, of the two speakers. Uh, what strikes me is, you know, we're not talking about a marginal difference. When we look at this disparity in murder rates and in crime rates, it's dramatic, and I think that looking at it in terms of getting a, you know, a little program here that'll do something better than the police and a little program here that's better than the police, I just don't see how that is going to directly affect such large disparities. Uh, and uh, Alex had mentioned that a lot of what he sees is because of the history of uh, racism. Uh, that suggests that if, if there's this history, there may be a kind of culture of violence that a, that a small subset, not a lot, but a small subset of young men in black neighborhoods uh, are acculturated into. And so, I'd like to see if there is any sense that uh, 
these small programs can have such a dramatic effect? And is there, is there any truth and therefore anything that can be done about this subset uh, culture of violence in communities? I'm sorry I'm long-winded. Uh, do you want to say something about that? Like the mass murders? Uh, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's the case that, that uh, serious violence in these communities is fairly concentrated among a fairly narrow population. These are not, so it's always a mistake, for instance, to say, well, you know, poverty causes this violence in some simplistic way because the vast majority of poor people are not engaged in these kinds of violent behaviors. Even the majority of young males are not involved in these really violent activities. And it is, I think, quite reasonable to try to figure out more or less who these young men are, and we are talking overwhelmingly about men in terms of gun violence. Uh, and, and it's also true that there is, a, I think, some kind of cultural effect at work here. I, my early training is in cultural anthropology. I believe that culture matters. I'm not uh, one of these uh, folks who shies away from any discussion of culture. That's part of the reason why a lot of short-term interventions have not been successful, because they're not able to undermine those longer-term trajectories. Just adding a few summer jobs one time is not going to fix this. It's going to require sustained interventions over time. And the question is, whether, for me, is, is more policing and incarceration going to be successful at changing that culture of violence? To me, that's likely to have exactly the opposite effect. It's going to reinforce those cultural tendencies. Instead, what we have to do is look for targeted interventions that are going to undermine those cultural tendencies. But that has to be combined with a kind of long-term commitment to doing something about the core economic and social conditions in those communities, and that kind of commitment is just completely absent in the co contemporary conversation. Okay, uh, so let's get to some. I would just say, can, can I? It, it, can I, people hear me? Or should I just sort of hard to go back? Uh, Why don't you both stand up there now when questions mm -hmm. are asked? Well, we can take turns or something. Yeah. Well, it's. Uh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> we, we did make a dent in the culture of violence. Again, let's look at the data in New York City. 2,245 homicides in 1990, 333 last year. The only thing that changed uh, was policing. Uh, I, I would say, for me, the important fact that I see as Professor Vitali noted, uh, is the problem of so many children being raised without fathers. Now, there are many heroic single mothers that are doing a fabulous job of raising their kids to be law-abiding uh, citizens, and they're against working against the odds, uh, and they deserve our support. But you have now an out-of-wedlock birth rate nationally for blacks that's 70% in places like Mott Haven. It's probably closer to 85%. That's a problem. On average, children do need mothers and fathers. The, the Asian out-of-wedlock birth rate is 16%. The Asian crime rate is negligible. Uh, it, it, there's very little victimization going on in this, those communities. Uh, so, and, and the economic conditions improve when crime drops. New York experienced an economic revival in, in many poor communities during the 90s because crime went down. It's, it's a reverse of the usual causation. The usual argument is, well, in order to bring crime down, you have to improve the economy. The economy in New York improved because we started being smarter about policing, using data, holding commanders accountable, uh, and that allowed businesses to move into areas 
that previously had to worry about their employees getting shot or mugged uh, on the way to work. So for economic development, the precondition is bringing crime down. Okay. So let me begin. So uh, this question is, do you think that the New York uh, City Police Department's decision in, in the 1990s to give up community policing and instead use large task force to flood crime areas uh, with officers was a good idea. I guess you've talked about that a bit. But. Well, community policing was ne C community policing was never really implemented during that period. It, it, they designated a few officers in specific precincts. They were given uh, you know nine to five shifts and uh, had some meetings with community members, but it wasn't certainly the models of either problem-oriented policing or other kind. So I think that um, that we don't know if that might have worked in essence because it wasn't really fully implemented. Uh, operation, the kind of flooding of communities, the operation impact kind of stuff. Well, you know, there is some research that shows some benefits, at least over short time horizons. There's some evidence that shows that it didn't just displace crime. I, I acknowledge that. It, uh, Zimmering thinks it had something to do with the crime decline, though a pretty small something. You know, remember, the crime decline was an international and is an international phenomenon. It's not just New York City. Tons of cities that have never heard of broken windows policing or Comstat also had very dramatic crime reductions. So, uh, in my mind, that can't possibly be the okay. full explanation. Well, uh, as Simring points out, the New York City crime drop was twice as deep and twice as long as the national average. Um, in Professor Vitale's book, he doesn't, he does not call, he doesn't like community policing. The question is, what does it mean? It's a, a term that every police department would embrace. I don't know a single police department that would say, we don't do community policing, everybody says they do it. So it's sort of hard to, one should have a more specific uh, definition of it. The NYPD would presumably say, we are doing community policing, we're listening to the community uh, that says, inevitably, we want public order enforcement. Uh, the, as Professor Vitale acknowledges, as far as flooding an area with officers, they are flooding hot spots. And this week, a National Academy of Sciences report came out, led by David Weisberg, that found that that targeted hot spot policing on shooting zones does, in fact, lower, lower shooting there. Okay, the next question has to do with, uh, there's often been a, you know, characterization of uh, militarization and weaponization of police. I guess it was highlighted in Ferguson a bit. Uh, do you think that that's a useful characterization uh, of how police are in neighborhoods, uh, this excessive militarization and weaponization of police? I think it's actually limited. We may be in some degree of agreement here. We'll find out in a second. But, um, I mean, I, I, I've written about protest policing for many years, and there are problems with the overuse of military equipment at protests. I think it was a big mistake at Ferguson. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the head of the, uh, the St. Louis County Police Force his prior assignment before being chief was head of the SWAT team. And that may have played a role in the decision to use such a kind of armored approach. But I don't think, for instance, the, many of the concerns that I have about policing in New York and other places can be reduced to talk about militarization. There certainly are examples, I think especially in some rural areas, where paramilitary training and the overuse of these units has contributed to some of the more problematic shootings where we've seen, where there's this threat neutralization mindset. They go through this training where they see all these videos of seemingly innocuous encounters that immediately turn deadly, and this contributes, I think, to some of the, some of the overreaction. 
But by and large, I don't think that's the, the root of the problem or, or even the should be our primary focus. I'll uh, agree. Okay, the next question has to do with uh, uh, rap music. What is this? Uh, gangster rap fashion ability as a driver of hoodlamization of youth culture in both black and white com communities. Uh, does anyone want to say anything about whether uh, gangster rap uh, plays a role? Uh, Not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say something about no. <laughs> you know, I think there's been people also object to violent videos, and and I think my understanding is is that. Research says it doesn't really matter. Contrary, I mean, I frankly, it's hard to believe it doesn't. Uh, if you if you are seeing a glorification of violence, but as I understand the effort to really pin that down, uh, they they can't find a, 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 a response to it. Surprisingly, I don't want my kids playing them, but but yeah, the research has been pretty consistent for an extended period of time now. Yeah. And in fact, my students actually, when I've asked them about the crime drop, especially 10, 15 years ago, I said, well, what happened to all the kids that were causing all the problems on the streets? And they said, oh, they're all watching video games and smoking weed. You mentioned yeah. beer. I think <laughs> beer. My experience is that it's weed, but nonetheless, that, that's what a lot of these young people are doing now. Well, on that note... Uh, marijuana enforcement. There are clear disparities between the number of summonses arrest in East Harlem versus Morningside Heights and Prospect Leffitt's Garden versus Park Slope. How is this not racist? Well, uh, police are responding to community requests for enforcement. I, again, I have heard the most amazing requests, and, and perhaps Professor Vidali did too, and, and as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the New York Times of all uh, press outlets documented this itself in, in this month's article about policing in New York. Uh, people that come to the police community council meetings complain about smelling weed in their hallway. I have heard this many, many times. I, in the 40th precinct in the South Bronx, a young lady complained about uh, the, the club outside of her window where people are hanging out and, and smoking weed. Uh, again, I don't know what the police are supposed to do in response to those requests. Uh, they are responding in a colorblind fashion. If they got the same complaints uh, in Park Slope, uh, they would make the same. They would they would engage in the same type of enforcement. The usual claim that the ACLU makes, uh, which is that there is identical drug use uh, among all racial groups, but the drug enforcement is is unequal. Again, A overlooks where the demands for enforcement are coming from, but that initial, the, the, the premise of that claim is not supported. There's research that's been done by the Justice Department that shows that rates of non-reporting of drug use on surveys is not equal. And the, the surveys tend to say, have you used drugs in the last year or the last month uh, and does not look at frequent drug use and the severity of drug use. Marijuana uh, addiction rates in, in the Washington, D.C. area of people that are, are committed to hospitals uh, for marijuana addiction show large racial disparities. Do you want to say anything? Sure. I, I, I find cigarette smoke really offensive. It played a direct contributing role in my father's death, and I'm very concerned that my kids might end up smoking cigarettes at some point, and I spent a lot of time talking to them about it. And I'm thankful that CUNY has a policy that says students shouldn't smoke on campus, but I don't think the police should have anything to do with it. 
and I you should legalize weed. <laughs> It should, I certainly agree with legalization or some form of decriminalization. I prefer a legalization regime personally. But, uh, yes, people are, complain about it. I'm not convinced that the complaints are as clearly aligned as is claimed. But even if they are, there's a reason why the public smoking is more prevalent where it is, and it has to do with the same factors I talked about before. People don't have space. People are doubled up. People don't have access to alternative forms of entertainment. It's, there are reasons why this happens, and we need to look at those reasons rather than just criminalizing people for a substance that's much less harmful than alcohol or tobacco. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you all came. Are there refreshments? Did you uh, I, get that? Are there refreshments over there, Don? Yes, sir. They've arrived, so we're so, good. So uh, I'm glad you came, and I hope uh, you found this constructive. Have a great night. <laughs>